Um, so today I'd like to uh, speak in English and we'll have both languages today, English and Khmer, for all of you to understand. Um, uh, at first, uh, I would like to pay homage to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, respectfully. And also, I would like to pay my respects to Venerable uh, Muni Poto uh, Sok TV, who is the Biko, uh, fully ordained uh, monk in the presence today, as long as uh, well as um, all the other fully ordained Biko monks that uh, reside here. And also would like to welcome everybody for coming and joining uh, in today's ceremony at Wat Kamera Po Thidam on uh, this Saturday evening, this is March 16th, um, 2019. Um, and today, uh, both of us will be doing a short Dhamma talk. So we will be explaining a little bit about today's uh, ritual, today's ceremony, and kind of why you're here, and everything that goes on in between as well. And for if you any reason have any questions upon anything, feel free to um, kind of take note of that and then you can ask us later. Or if there's something that we talk about and you want to ask at the moment, it's okay too. Um, but if you have questions, feel, please don't hesitate to ask us. Um, but um, the reason for us doing this Dhamma talk is, uh, is traditional within Buddhism and traditional in all rituals or ceremonies that we perform within the faith. Um, it's very key to have as well. Um, the main objective uh, from a Dhamma talk is to be able to help, <clears throat> excuse me, help um, not only the civilians or lay people that come to the temple, but um, it is for us as monks to be able to teach and help you understand more about a ceremony, a particular ceremony, or understand more deeply into Buddhism, have a more clear understanding uh, of what Buddhism really is and how we can practice it on a daily basis. Um, thus, we have the Dhamma talk. Um, and of course, it comes in different languages according to uh, your residency or your local tea. Um, but the, the most important thing of the Dhamma talk is to be able to teach um, lay people or participants within uh, the ceremony to understand Buddhism more clear. Uh, this is why we have this today. Um, and so, uh, I'm not sure <laughs> what else. Um, I've seen it on, yeah. One year, oh, this is a so one year anniversary, correct? Yeah. One year anniversary? Is this no, one year? Not anniversary. Anniversary. Yeah, anniversary. Yeah, anniversary. Yeah, anniversary. Yeah, so it's one one year anniversary, right? No, anniversary. anniversary. We yeah. So we it's, it's important that we understand the different terms, right? Because terms one one word can mean different things, right? So anniversary can use um, like a, uh, when we celebrate birthday. Is anniversary is you know one kind of like one round, one circle, right? 
And so uh, one anniversary for the funeral or for your mom's death is, you know, one anniversary, right? The next year is going to be two, right? And so it's important that we understand those terms and uh, not have any misunderstandings within that. Um, this is why we have the Dhamma talk, so we can talk about these things um, and kind of make it uh, more clear. But um, so as the one year anniversary, very important to come together as a family and being able to pay the respects um, to your mother um, or grandmother or aunt um, or those, not only that particular person, but our ancestors that have passed along as well. Um, and we do that with the, the different rituals that we have within the ceremony here, such as what we just did, um, paying respects to the triple gem. Now the triple gem is the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. The, the Dhamma is uh, Buddhist teaching, right? So we say Dhamma, right? So Buddha is Buddha, uh, the fully enlightened one. Dhamma is his teachings, and Sangha is uh, the community of monks that continue on his teachings and being able to practice on a daily basis, right? So we call this uh, a, the triple gem. Um, and that's what we um, did in the beginning, what you did in the beginning, um, where you face that way and you chan uh, chanting, right? And then when you come and turn to us, you ask for the five precepts. You know the five precepts? No? <laughs> really? <laughs> the five precepts? The, the, the five precepts are very core into not only Buddhism, but moral aspects, right? This is the morality of life, the five precepts that everybody should, um, should uh, intake is uh, to abstain from killing, to abstain from anything that is not given, so not stealing, right? Um, mm -hmm and not abstain from committing adultery uh, and uh, abstain from lying and abstain from um, in taking uh, anything that causes intoxication so whether it's alcohol whether it's drugs anything that causes heedlessness right we abstain from that so those are the five precepts that we uh, is important as humans to be able to hold to be able to practice on a daily basis because these five precepts can cause many negative actions that we may regret in the future right now do you think it's good to to lie to other people no right because lying can cause other things right other negative actions that come upon us or anyone else and the same thing with you know uh, intoxication and uh, stealing or killing any living beings these are all um, moral aspects that we as Buddhists and humans uh, must be able to perform on a daily basis to abstain from those five things. Um, now this is a you know, very short but also concise uh, teachings of Buddhism and that's what you did, uh, the second activity, asking for precepts. Um, and then we have the Paritta chanting um, and this is um, kind of like um, uh, being able to chant for your um, protection, right? For your protection, uh, spiritually protection, right? Um, and also um, teach upon happiness and how we perform that on a daily basis within the Pali chanting uh, that I told you before uh, in the beginning, the Pali, right? Um, so these are the, the, the activities that take place uh, traditionally within a Buddhist ceremony um, and this is what we are gathered today to do. And all of this are what we call uh, generating merit, right? We've talked about merit uh, a little bit ago, right? Being able to generate that and being able to share that um, with uh, your mother or grandmothers, um, and, you know, her passing on and we share that with her um, and not only with her but all with our relatives that are here and those who are not able to come we spread uh, we call metta have you ever heard of metta before metta loving kindness compassion yeah compassion 
So we spread compassion with everyone else with the merit that we generate. So I will only take a, this short moment, um, and now I'd like to give uh, the microphone to Vernable Sok TV, who will be also explaining both in English and Khmer. Uh, no more than the... It means well done when you say sa tu, and you say okay, no more than the or no more than na, which means may you be rejoiced with the merit. So you say sa tu in reply to that. Sato, which means well done. Yeah. Uh, nhôm, để ông lấy cuối, bên chè bên cua, dân, bên xa khmer nắng dân, tây sna hoa, tây ngày dân nhịp nhôm sụp ai từ xa sna ba, tam youtube internet, vọt na cơ lư đất hoa tây sna, tân na tân thơ tam, chẳng dân cầm rò bàn lập cả, tiền nghi tiền chân chiết mà sập thoa nó cầm rò này, bàn chỉ kê mau hơi dân cua chưa tập cạn là bị sập xài ở cái bàn chôn là vậy để chỉ Phật sát na nhóm là rồi ngày cào tới cái chia lá có cái năng mau to tiệt năng này đẹp lá tới miền sơn thì chia lá thôi từ bù tiệt của miền hết sập xài và thò mình to tiệt thấy tôi nhận nhau để miền cua xa kèn ngày chẳng chỉ chìm non cua xa mau cầu này đã che mai nắng non mau và dân miền ăn sầm đầy đủ ai thì dây ăn lấy bàn là thà đã đọc và đã đọc bên nhà chia chìm thì dây Ờ, chị dìm này dây tầm bây ấy tầm bây ấy bàn Kê dô lô phong á, ai bàn phụ bọt tay nâng khá nè Nghĩ bàn lưu thoa đấy nâng, của dân dây tầm khmai nâng Nâng khmai dân xạ công khmai dân nghe á Và thoa cục tì cả lai nâng tầy dân chân lê Nâng tầm chân sẽ đạc tiết á Tầy khá nè khá nè tầy bàn lưu bật thoa của khoa nè bàn dù lô Chẳng bàn dì kê mau vọt á, dân chưa tầm khá hành chân mà xong thật chật nhôm á Thì sẽ nhôm, nhôm một chạc rồi, nhôm một Nâng ngay công phân tròn đấy hay bà xe bà thma này dây ông lê Bà khăn yên lý tức Dô nha So là just apologize for my English Ok Mình trầm mà có tới nhôm tầng tầng của mà nẹ đá nè So my broken English just apologize for that but I try to You know give the the whole idea about the funeral ceremony, why in the Buddhist tradition, uh, for anyone who has passed away or you know uh, has dead, you know, have been dead, so why do we invite the monks for ceremony? Uh, we do the chanting as a way of giving blessing, you know, or uh, people come and ask for the five moral precepts from the monk. So why is that, all of this? And after that, invite the monk for Dhamma talk. So the monk will have an important role to uh, explain the meaning and the essence of why we have to do such kind of ceremony, you know. Because this is very important, not just for, you know, for those who are living, was still alive, but even for those who has passed away also. Uh, within the Buddhist tradition, from the teachings of the Buddha, that he taught that uh, when we are still alive, uh, if we want to offer something to other people, yeah, we can present them uh, with materials, with food, with any four requisites, you know, lodging, clothing, medicine, whatever. We can hand over, you know, directly by hand, you know, but for people who passed away, how can we present them, you know, whatever we want to give to them? How can we do that? Because we, we don't even know where they have gone, you know, after they're passing away. So, uh, in some uh, uh, religious belief, or maybe uh, some people, they believe that after we, after we die, maybe uh, the soul remain or stay somewhere, you know, this is just idea of people. But in Buddhism, you know, uh, what made up us as a human being is only composed of two main elements, which is the matter and the mind. Mind and matter are the body, physical body, and the mind. So these two component things made up as a human life. Or in another, in another way, uh, in the, the Buddhist ultimate teachings that the Buddha expounded, uh, Shu Ben Ming is made up of the five aggregates, just only a heap of aggregate. Five, what are the five? 
one is materiality, you know, corporality or materiality, and second is sensation or feeling. Third is um, perception or memory. Fourth is mental formation or fabrication or volitional activity. And fifth is consciousness, what we call mind, you know. So with, within these five, we call it as the five aggregate or five hips, you know, refer to the human life, you know. It's, we are a form of that, we are a form of, yeah, materiality, sensation, perception, mental formation, and consciousness. So these five can be categorized as uh, body, yeah, materiality is a physical body, and the last, the last, the remaining four uh, belong to the consciousness group, which is called mind. So in short, our life is made up of two elements, which is mind and matter. You got the, the, the meaning? Yeah, mind and matter. In another way, yeah, if we're going to analyze in more detail, uh, our body uh, is being supported by the four primary elements, which is the soil or earth element, water element, air element, and the fire element. Yeah, so yeah, our body is just supported by that four primary elements. Without these four elements, we cannot, you know, I mean, we cannot exist, we cannot live on. Like uh, the skin, the hair, or the bone is all made up of the uh, soil or earth element, right? And like the water element throughout our body, it has water, right? I even, yeah, I drop, what do you call tears? tears? Yeah, tears, e everywhere. Yeah, don't laugh at me, English, okay? <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. Everywhere is watery, right? Throughout, through the whole body, even like when we become sweating, this is so cold because of um, water element. And third one is air element in which we are able to move, to speak, you know, to, to walk, to sit, yeah, to uh, your four postures, uh, to be able to move around, you need air element, yeah. And uh, number four is the fire. Fire, uh, the characteristic of fire, not just heat, heatness, but also the coldness, you know, which is the characteristic of the fire element. So this is a temp temperature in our body. Without this temperature, we cannot live, right? Yeah, so these four are the main or the four primary elements which support the life to, to, to live. And one more, adding with the space, you know, yeah, so these four as, as, as one group, well, four primary elements, one space, and one consciousness. Yeah, this is called human life, you know, human being, yeah. Supported by the four primary elements, and then with the space, yeah, in which we can breathe, you know, without a proper space, we cannot breathe, right? For example, if you go to Mars or Moon, you may encounter different gravity, different, you know, ways of live, you know, yeah. So uh, with that space, we are able to breathe naturally yeah. and uh, adding with more, one more consciousness, the knowing object. Without that, you know, uh, the body is uh, useless, is essenceless without the consciousness, just like the corpse, just like the dead body, right? Yeah. Having no mind without being conscious is like a dead it's like a corpse. So we are, uh, the life comes into existence only when there is consciousness in there. You know? So we also believe that um, when we die, the body come to decay. So the consciousness has to seek a new form, a new accommodation. If we are go going to compare human life as we know that uh, it is made up of uh, body and mind. So the body is just like accommodation, the shelter for the mind to accommodate. So the mind is like, body is like the house and the mind is like the householder, you know. So when the house is collapsed, you know, cannot use anymore, you need to build a new one, right? Yeah, the householder need to build a new house for that. So in the same way, uh, Passing away or death, you know, actually it's not the end of life. 
it is just the end of this old or what we call aging body that it is decaying when it is decaying it has no more use we cannot use it anymore just like the broken car or broken machine that cannot work anymore so we need to repair or we need to buy a new one so in the same way death does not mean the end of life because after we die the process start again what we call um, it, if, if we talk about the ultimate reality or the ultimate teachings in Buddhism you know after the after the body come to decay yeah, I yeah sit, sit any way you want okay just feel comfortable for your posture yeah doesn't matter don't need to be yeah okay yeah no need to do palm hands yeah, just relax. sit and relax most importantly just to pay attention to what i'm talking yeah yeah if you have a question you can ask so that is not the end of life but it is a start of a new life as well in buddhism yeah uh, there is a concept of rebirth we don't call it reincarnation neither we don't call it resurrection like in christianity you may have learned that there is a resurrection of life right in christianity but to none of this concept is right only a rebirth that the buddha do, does explain expounded that after death there will be a life as long as we haven't uprooted or cut off the root cause of being born after die we still have to gain another rebirth you know existence after existence life after life will have to come endlessly and as long as there is life the buddha also said that there will be a suffering that's why in the his essence teaching of the four noble truths which is he said uh, at the very beginning first of all we have to accept we have to uh, you know understand that life is suffering because being born is suffering you know you can think of that in your uh, practical life you know why the Buddha said life is suffering during your life, during your daily work, you know, uh, how many problems you have faced, how many difficulties you have faced in your life, throughout your life, you know, since the day you born, you know, how, how many, you know, problems you have caused to your parents, to your family, to your neighbors, yeah, you may, you may think of those problems, yeah. So, in short, uh, why the Buddha said life is suffering? If we don't get what we want, you know, we also feel sorrow, we also feel upset, you know, unsatisfied. And having met something which we don't want to meet, it also causes suffering, you know. To live in a place where we don't like, or to encounter, you know, uh, thing that you don't like, this is also suffering. Aging is also suffering, sickness is also suffering, death is also suffering, life is also suffering. You know, why the Buddha point out this problem? Some people may raise a question that Buddhism is uh, pessimistic, you know, because the Buddha always said, oh, life is suffering. But actually not. You know. The Buddha said, actually the teaching is the universal truth. It is not just uh, what he thought. It is not just belong for Buddhists. It is a it is a natural law that every life come into existence have to face the same thing. You know, we face thing that we don't like, and what what we want it to be, but it it doesn't come the way we want. It. We also face suffering, a lot of problem. You can think of that in your. Uh, daily basis, you know. So just in short, birth is suffering, aging is suffering, sickness is suffering, death is suffering, you know. Separated with your loved one, also suffering, like your relatives, you know. How many of your relatives has been passed away, you know, in the past. So you have faced some 
disappointment in your life you know this is kind of suffering in short physical suffering and mental suffering right and he went on no, not just pointing out that life is a problem or life has a suffering but he went on with the second noble truth which he pointed out that the root cause of suffering the origin of suffering is caused by your own attachment your own craving right for example if you love somebody if you love your mom one day your mom passed away how do you feel you don't like it to happen right yeah, the same way to everybody we don't want our beloved relatives or families passed away or face suffering but thing doesn't go the way we want it to be you know it's the natural law nobody can can change it this is the natural law right everybody faces it so the buddha point out that why we feel suffer when something happen and we don't like it and something that we like but it doesn't succeed the way we want to be we also feel disappointed we also feel sorrow suffering upset you know because of our attachment we expect something you know, because of our expectation it brings disappointment right there is a saying like if you don't have expectation oh okay expect nothing and nothing will disappoint you if you expect something expectation mean you grave on to something crave yeah crave crave yeah crave like craving yeah you attach on something you love something or even you hate something not just love you know in between like and dislike if you are attached with these two concepts between like and dislike you cannot get away from suffering so in between the buddha go in the middle way what we call what he call an equanimous mind <coughs> without having attachment over you know things like what we call lustful desire or sensual pleasure or go with the other side hatred you know anger anxiety frustration you know whatever in short, we say like like and dislike. We have to go in between. Don't stay in either side, like like or dislike, but in between equanimous, so that you don't have attachment over what you have. You know, in real life, whatever you have, you always have attachment on that, right? You have wife, you have attachment. You have children, you have attachment with them. You have physical body, you have attachment with your body. If it gets sick, you feel suffering. If it get aging, you feel suffering. Your eye, your teeth, go to clinic, get you know yeah. dental clinic, and they clean, and you feel painful. It's about suffering, right? Mm -hmm. You have iPhone, you attach my iPhone, you know, and one day you forget it, you lose it somewhere. Oh, I lost my iPhone, suffering again because you think this is mine, this is I, this is mine. The concept, you know, the concept. That's why in Buddhism we have another characteristic we call anatta, the theory of uh, selflessness or the theory of egolessness. That the Buddha said, nothing is really belong to us. Even ourself is only a, a formation of five aggregate or or a formation of mind and body. If we break into pieces into very detail, we cannot find whether it's I, whether it's mind. Know, in ultimate reality it is only uh, materials and mentality and nothing in here that we can find where is I where is mine but in real life people tend to attach so much with that very idea so that's why some people become very egocentric you know very selfish because of their because of their selfishness they create a lot of trouble to the other people to the world so this is so that the origin of suffering comes from human craving or attachment. You got it? So further, the Buddha also pointed out the third noble truth, that is the cessation of suffering. We know that life is suffering. And then you have to find out what is the root cause of my suffering. Then you find that, oh, okay, because of my attachment, which has been sponsored by my ignorance. So it caused my 
you know, my mind to attach on this, to attach on that. And with that attachment of mind, it will cause a lot of suffering to me. But the Buddha said, if you, find, you, if you can find out the, the root cause of the problem, then you can solve it. So this is the third noble truth, the cessation of suffering. There must be a way to end suffering. So the fourth noble truth, the Buddha expounded about the way in which we can totally liberate ourselves from physical suffering and mental suffering. Yeah. So this fourth noble truth, it is a way leading to the complete cessation of suffering, which composed of eight factors the Buddha expounded, the eight principles in which you can take into your application and you can get away from suffering step by step. The more you practice, you know, the more you, you will gain liberation day by day, eventually. You know. So what are the eight? One is the right understanding. This is very important in life to have right understanding, samatate. Number two is right aspiration or right intention. Number three is right action. Number four is right speech. Number five is right livelihood. Number six is right effort. Number seven is right mindfulness. And number eight is right concentration. So these are the eight principles in for any living beings to in order to get themselves liberated from suffering, they must follow this eight noble eightfold path. And in short, it can be categorized into three categories. So the right understanding and right thinking or right intention comes under the group of wisdom. In Buddhism, we call it as a three models or three trainings in Buddhism, which is uh, virtue or morality, concentration, number two, and third is wisdom. So these three are the you know, practical method to liberate ourselves from you know, cycle of suffering, cycle of life and death, samsara. So the first two, the right understanding and right thinking come under the group of wisdom you know, having right understanding and having right thinking or right aspiration, right intention, it will lead you to wisdom. And second group, right speech, right action, right livelihood. This come under the group of virtue or morality, ethical code of conduct. You know, it's the basis of how you should avoid, what you should refrain and what you should develop in your life, you know, like bad actions or demoratorious actions you have to avoid, evil action you have to avoid, and meritorious action, good action, wholesome action you have to perform. So this is about the virtue, moral precept in Buddhism that we have to undertake. And third group, finally, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration come under the group of concentration or meditation. In Buddhism, this is the three stages that uh, Buddhists, they you know, been developing day by day, time by time, in order to liberate themselves, you know, life after life. So they become more liberated or less suffering, you know, because of their practice based on these three stages. That's why a lot of people nowadays, especially in the Western, they become more interested in doing meditation or concentration because it is a way uh, to purify our mind, you know, from all the negativity, from all defilements, which always disturb us, you know, negativity of the mind, you know, some uh, what we call evil thoughts arises like greed, hatred, at attachment, delusion, you know, whatever. So this can be completely purified when we do meditation or concentration. It's a way of mental training or mental cultivation in which you can develop your mind to become higher and higher, purer and purer, you know. So this is just a very, um, you know, the basic teachings in Buddhism, but uh, so I talk a lot already. I doesn't go into funeral yet. So just, okay, <laughs> when a person dies, you know, we cannot hand things directly to them, but uh, Buddha said there is a way when we do uh, offering with the virtuous person, like the monks, the priest, whatever you may call it, or some, you know, lay people that they have, uh, they are virtuous, that they develop, you know, morality or whatever, good quality uh, or ethical code of conduct, so they are worthy of respect. 
so that we can do charity offer or donation with them you know with that out, out of our devotion out of our faith out of out of our good volition in charity in respect to them we generating a lot of good action uh, you know we accumulating a lot of uh, meritorious action so with that action you can dedicate to your departed one you know you, you may say a word you know verbally or you even you think in your mind like this is the way how buddhists they dedicate merit to their departed ones you know by saying like okay uh, my parents by the name of mr a or miss a you know, by the power of good actions that i have done previously or now or in the future uh, may all this merit be accrued to you, to this person or that person, you know, may you rejoice with the good deed that I have done, you know, so if you were to be born in uh, vocal abodes or suffering world, may you be liberated from that place and by, by the power of good actions that I have done, may you be reborn in the blissful realm, you know, and so we do that with our, what we call uh, uh, resolution, you know, our meditation mind, you know, thinking in your mind or say it out verbally in, in the way that I just told, you got it? So in that way, you can dedicate uh, meritorious action to your departed one, you know, because we know that uh, the, the mind has a power. That's why people call it the power of the mind, you know. The body has no power. It's only just made up of material to support life. But what is powerful, what is what that can travel beyond this world is the mind only the mind but the mind that really has power is only when we develop it well so how to develop the mind in order it to become powerful that we can even transcend it or you know move it beyond the place that any material cannot go through you know yeah. by meditation by doing good action so the more you generate good thought within yourself the more the power of the mind increases you know so the, it really has the power but you have to experience it by yourself to in order to understand it clearly and correctly so by just listening to what i'm saying you not really know how it works how it you know how it goes so you have to taste it by yourself practice that and you will understand it by yourself okay so i hope this little short dhamma talk will give have give you some idea about why we buddhists uh, perform always perform such ceremony you know why and what purpose and how you know so i hope next time if you come again and again we will have more time to talk and explain you more and if you have questions right now feel free to ask because this is the end of my dhamma talk okay thank you very much may you all be happy okay uh, Any but ตอนนี้ตอนนี้ไม่ได้ไม่ได้ไม่ได้ไม่ได้ไม่ได้ไม่ได้ไม่ได้ไม่ได้ไม่ได้ไม่ได้ไม่ได้ไม่ได้ไ
either physically or I mentally. Say bugs. I, I yeah. So well, not ants. So no. we try to refrain from harming well, physically and me mentally. <laughs> yeah. I didn't Any, know you're not no really living in the temple. I didn't know I was trying to help. That's yeah. a whole moment. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, now you now we know. I think he understand more than you. <laughs> so this this is why it's important during the Dharma talk and after, just like Venerable TV had said, is that it's important for us to actually practice, right? And being able to understand of when we harm other beings, what does this cause on other beings and ourselves as well, right? And so it's, it's very important that we put this practice into everyday usage, right? Everyday daily life, whether you're, you come to the temple or whether you're in your own household or whether you're in your work environment, wherever you are, it's important for us to practice Buddhism and refrain from harming any you know, beings, no matter how small, no matter how big, even if an ant, even if, you know, um, even uh, human beings, you know, we refrain from harming physically and mentally. <laughs> Take it, but don't kill it. <laughs> so don't she asked, uh, what happens if like an ant goes into your ear or something, right? And so, yeah, we, we can pay attention to it, but we have to, you know... Find a way really not to kill, not yeah. to make harm. You know, bad action or good action done with an evolution. Mm -hmm. Not any excuse, either like, oh, okay, because... Uh, it kills me or it bites me, you know, you cannot say that. Volition is karma, it's action. If you have bad action, if you have bad volition, it con it constitutes a bad karma that will give a bad result. If you have a good volition, it will constitute a good karma that will give you a good result, either in the present or in the future life, like after. Yes. Got it?